Welcome to the Employment Law and HR Podcast with your host, Allison Colley. Welcome to this episode 148 of the Employment Law and HR Podcast. I'm your host, Alison Colley. I'm an employment solicitor and HR specialist, and I run the firm Real Employment Law Advice, where we provide advice and assistance to both employers and employees. Now, this is the second instalment of a mini-series focusing on redundancy, and today I'm going to be talking about the consultation process and getting started, including some tips and hints about the timing for consultation and also some issues to consider in relation to the current climate and what we're experiencing with relation to the coronavirus. If you are considering making redundancies during this time, um, obviously this podcast is a great resource for you. We cover off lots of information, but you might also want to join us on the free webinar that we're running on Wednesday the 20th of May. And you can register for your place on that on our website. And it's advice for employers dot co dot uk forward slash events and on there you'll see the link where you can sign up on eventbrite and you can register for your free ticket for that and we'll be covering off lots of information on redundancy but as i said of course we'll be covering everything you need to know in this podcast over the forthcoming weeks as well so without further ado i'm going to get into this week's featured content This week I'm going to be talking to you about consultation, so redundancy consultation, which is the very first stage of the redundancy process. So as a business, you have made the decision that you need to consider redundancies or making staff redundant, and therefore you would start the consultation process. Now there are two types of consultation. There is collective consultation and just the ordinary consultation. Now, collective consultation applies when you are making 20 or more employees redundant within 90 days at one establishment. So let's just say you run a business and you have a staff of 100 and you're looking at maybe downsizing one of your departments, which means that you could potentially be making 20 or more staff redundant within a 90 day period. In that case, you would have an obligation to collectively consult. And I'll be talking about that in a moment. But firstly, I'm going to tell you about what you need to do when you're consulting and you're making less than 20 employees redundant. So in either case, consultation is essential for the fairness of a redundancy dismissal. Now, redundancy, as I said in the first episode of this mini series, is a potentially fair reason for dismissing an employee. You have to be sure that it's a redundancy situation and then you need to follow a fair process. And that's where the consultation comes in. The leading case on redundancy consultation is a case known as Polkey. And for those of you who listen to the unfair dismissal miniseries, you will have heard about Polkey in terms of compensation. But Polkey applied in relation to consultation for redundancy. And within that case, it said that there is a duty to warn and consult employees where you are potentially making them redundant. And Polky also said that you can't argue that it would make no difference to the process. So you can't say, well, I didn't consult because, you know what, we were going to make them redundant anyway. Um, There was no other choice. You know, the books look so bad, we had to make cuts somewhere. So we had no choice. So consulting would have made no difference. You can't say that. If you do say that, it's likely to be an unfair dismissal and you will have an unfair dismissal decision against you and then you will have to run the gauntlet of seeing whether the employment tribunal will accept your argument and reduce compensation accordingly. The key thing that came from Polkey is you can't argue that it makes no difference and regardless of the number of employees you're making redundant or the circumstances you need to follow some form of consultation in order for it to be a fair dismissal. So as I said, just because you may be making only one position redundant, you would still need to go through that fair process. You've got a duty to consult them. And even if you're a small employer, there's no excuse to say, well, I'm a small employer, I couldn't do it, or there wasn't the time, or I didn't know what I was doing. What I would say about redundancy consultation is that it's really not that onerous. I have been advising people recently who have been and making, you know, one or two positions within their business redundant due to business changes or business restructures and organisations. And so in those circumstances, we've just gone through 
a fairly simple, straightforward consultation process, but it just gives the employee the opportunity to have some form of consultation and to go through a fair process. So as I say, it's really not that onerous. And if you are worried about doing it yourself for whatever reason, then you can always contact your local friendly employment solicitor um, like myself, and they'll be happy to guide you through it and even to run the meetings for you if you really feel that you can't do it. In order for a dismissal for redundancy to be fair, as I said, you need to have consultation, but your consultation has to be meaningful. So you have to genuinely engage in it and give the employees the opportunity to have their say. There is a leading case on this and it's R versus British Coal Corporation and the Secretary of State for Trade and Industry from 1994. And from that case, a number of points came out about how you undertake a meaningful and fair consultation. So what you need to do is when you're consulting, you have to have an open mind. You have to still have in mind that it's an idea at that stage. You can't have to say that actually, you know, whatever happens, we're going to do this anyway. Um, you need to have that in mind. You need to be able to be open to and responsive to what the employees have to say. You have to give the employees or their representatives sufficient information about the redundancy circumstances and the reasons behind it. So in order that they can then consult and come up with any ideas alternatives that sort of thing and equally you have to give them time to respond so you have to be reasonable about the amount of time now we'll hear in a moment about collective consultation and the minimum periods that are required now if you're making less than 20 staff redundant there isn't any minimum period of consultation but I would say as a very minimum you should be looking about a week in order to ensure that you have the opportunity for them to consider the options and for it to be fair now, it, ideally, you should give them a little bit more time, but I would say a week would be um, the minimum. And if you don't give them a reasonable amount of time to respond, then the fairness of the process could be called into question. So it's no good to call somebody into a meeting on Monday and say, look, we are starting a consultation for redundancy and we need to have your responses by Wednesday. Um, and the employee, for instance, doesn't work on a Tuesday. You know, that's just not, that would be unfair to do. And, and you would probably fail to convinced employment tribunal that you've undertaken a meaningful consultation and what you have to do as well is when you're going through the consultation you have to pay attention to what the employees are telling you and what they're saying you can't just pay lip service to their responses to the consultation you have to give them you know the benefit of the doubt and you have to listen to what they have to say and you might be surprised in fact actually what comes out of the consultation I've been involved in some situations where um, the employer really didn't think there was any alternative. They had to make somebody redundant, you know, out of a pool or two or three. And then what happened was the employees got together and said, well, we would rather all be in a job but have less money and less hours than one of us be without a job. And they were all really good friends. So they got together and they came up with an idea. So essentially, instead of having two members of staff full time, they had three members of staff who covered all the work for two um, and they all dropped some of their hours and dropped some of their pay. And that prevented somebody being made redundant. It also meant that for the employer, they were able to retain the skills and experience of three members of staff so that in the event that the business did turn around and they, they did have capacity to employ three people in the future, they wouldn't have to go through an expensive recruitment process and training. So it worked really well for all parties. So my suggested format for a consultation where you have less than 20 employees potentially being made redundant would be to invite all the employees to a meeting to inform them and their representatives if they have a trade union or elected representatives of what their position is and to start the consultation. So you should give them information about what's happening and tell them that it's starting it. As I said, you should give them a minimum of a week to consider and come up with any responses. And then at the end of the week, I would suggest that you meet again with all staff and their representatives and put them on notice that they will be having individual meetings shortly. And at that meeting, you tell them about the selection criteria that you're proposing to use to select your employees that are going to be made redundant. Now, in episode three of this mini series on redundancy, I'm going to be talking to you about selection criteria and how you establish the pools for redundancy and how you come up with a fair selection criteria. So I'll leave that for now. And then thirdly, the next step would be to invite the individuals to a meeting during which you give them the opportunity to respond individually 
and you give them the opportunity to discuss the selection criteria and how you've reached that and give their suggestions for avoiding redundancy if they've what they've come out at the bottom end of the uh, selection criteria. Those are my tips for dealing with redundancy consultations with less than 20 staff. But as I've said all throughout, if you've got 20 or more staff who are being made redundant at one establishment, then you have a legal duty to collectively consult with the employees. And that is to follow a minimum consultation process. Now, the first thing that you would need to do is if you think that you're going to be making 20 or more staff redundant, would be to contact the Secretary of State. Now, you're required to do that and to inform them of the redundancy situation. And there is a specific form that you can use for this, which you can find online and which I'll put a link to in my show notes. And that's form HR1. And that's the form that you're required to notify with. And for those employers who might be thinking, well, what's all that about? Well, it's a criminal offence not to notify the Secretary of State about collective redundancy. And you could be subject to an unlimited fine if you fail to do so. So it's really important that you keep that in mind. And when you're calculating the potential numbers for redundancy, you need to include those people who are being made redundant voluntarily. So if you start your process by asking for voluntary redundancies and people come forward and then that added together with those that you're making compulsory redundant could mean that there are more than 20 or 20 or more, should I say, then you would be required to notify the Secretary of State. And it is within a 90-day period. So if you think there might be future changes to the business or a future necessity to make cutbacks, for instance, then you should consider collectively consulting from the outset. Now, the consultation process, there is a minimum period for dealing with this. And that is, if you've got 20 to 99 members of staff being made redundant, then you must have at least 30 days before So you must give notice to the Secretary of State at least 30 days before the first dismissal takes effect. And if you've got 100 or more, then it's 45 days before the first dismissal takes effect. You must notify the Secretary of State. And you must also send a copy of the HR1 form to the employee representatives. So that's the requirement to notify the Secretary of State. And then there are other requirements that you must follow in terms of the consultation process. So you must consult with the appropriate representatives of the affected employees. And now appropriate representatives are the trade union, if you have one that you recognise, and or elected representatives. So if there is no trade union, then it would be elected representatives. Now the affected employees are those employees who are affected by the proposed redundancy or any measures that might be taken in connection with the dismissals. So not only do you need to ensure that the um, representatives of employees being made redundant are consulted but also representatives for employees who are potentially remaining at work but who might be subject to changes in their organisation or new ways of working or new employment contracts or new lines of reporting so anybody that may be subject to changes as a result of the redundancies. Now if you don't have a recognised trade union and you don't have elected representatives then you would be required to go through an election process prior to the consultation to elect representatives for your employees. Now, if you're electing representatives due to the collective consultation process, then there are statutory rules that apply on how you do this. So what I would say to you as an organisation is, regardless of your size, you may want to consider having elected representatives of staff in advance of any situation like this happening. Because if you undertake that process when you don't have in mind that you might be making redundancies or changes then there aren't any specific rules that you have to follow and then you've got them in place and they can be a sort of liaison point for all staff on many issues so it's a really good practice to do so but if you don't have elected representatives and you have to the first time you have to consider it is when you are making redundancies then you have to go through the legal rules on how you elect them and if you fail to do so then it could give rise to a claim by the employees for what's known as a protective award which I'm going to talk about in a moment about the consultation process so um, yeah it's really important to follow I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of how you 
uh, follow the statutory rules for electing representatives on this podcast. But if you do have any questions about that or you find yourself in that situation, you can contact me. You can drop me an email. It's alison at realemploymentlawadvice.co.uk. So for anybody who would like more information about the process for electing employee representatives, then I will be covering this off in the next podcast, uh, a short podcast on this for you. Okay, so you've got your elected representatives or the trade union in place and you've notified the Secretary of State and you're starting the consultation process. Well, the consultation process can be found in two stages. First, you've got the provision of information. So you need to provide a minimum required information to representatives and trade unions and then you go on to the process of consultation. So it's a two-stage part process. Now, the period of consultation need not actually be for the full 30 or 45 days that you're required to um, notify the Secretary of State. However, it is advisable to try to ensure that as much as possible you fulfil the the full length of a consultation period so that you can at least justify your decision making. But you can give notice to employees to terminate their employment prior to the end of the 30 or 45 day period as long as their termination doesn't take effect until after that time. So let's just say you start your consultation process and actually it runs for four weeks and you've got to the end of it, there aren't any alternatives, you've selected your employees for redundancy and then some of them have got lengthy notice periods, so let's just say three months and you need them to work in order to fulfil the final elements of the contracts, for, for instance. So you can give employees notice that their employment will terminate before the end of the 45-day period. As long as you've done a fair consultation, you've fulfilled the processes that you're required to and you've given notice but they're not going to finish until after that period, then that that should be fine, you'll be covered. So what happens if you get things wrong, if you don't fulfil the requirements of the collective consultation process? Well, as I said before, if you fail to notify the Secretary of State, it's a criminal offence and you could get a fine. And you could also find yourself with an employment tribunal claim by your employees for what is known as the protective award. Now, the protective award is a week's pay for each week of the protective period that the employment tribunal considers to be just and equitable in all the circumstances of the case. And that's subject to a 90 day maximum. The amount of protective award that will be awarded to employees will depend on the seriousness of the breach, uh, any mitigating circumstances that you might provide as the employer. But what you should know is that it's, it's actually designed to be a fine. It's designed to be something that is a deterrent to employers rather than it being compensation. So it's really down to the behaviour, your behaviour or your failures to follow. And that's what the Employment Tribunal uses as a measure when deciding how much protective award to give to employees. So just some examples of the type of amount of award and the circumstances in which uh, protective awards have been given is where the employer had been completely unaware of their legal obligations to consult and hadn't undertaken any consultation whatsoever. They were ordered to pay a 90-day protective award to their employees. So ignorance of the law is no defence and you will be ordered to pay that amount of compensation, which could be fairly hefty for you on top of redundancy payments, um, notice payments, all that sort of thing, if you've got a number of employees that are affected. And then there have been cases where, for instance, um, the consultation didn't go forward as it should have done because the trade union hadn't been willing to cooperate. And in that case, it was a 30-day award against the employer. So there's just an idea of the sort of circumstances. So there are some mitigating factors in that case, which means it was a 30-day award. What I would say to you is my top tips about dealing with redundancy, particularly if you're looking at a collective redundancy, so where you've got a number of employees that are potentially being made redundant, you should seek some advice. Seek some advice from somebody who knows what they're talking about and who can guide you through the process. It's much better to do it that way and it will cost you much less in the long run than if you get it wrong. And even if you think, actually, you know, we're not going to tip over into that 20 or more, I would suggest that you err on the side of caution. If you look like the numbers for redundancy are nearing to 20 or could potentially get to that point, 
I would suggest that you err on the side of caution and follow the full process. It doesn't have to be as onerous as you might think and it certainly will save you, as I say, save you money in the long run. Now, when we are thinking about consultation and the collective consultation process in relation to the current climate where we are social distancing and perhaps people are based all over the place uh, and we can't get all employees together at the same time, then it would be advisable to allow more time for the consultation process to take place and to make adjustments so that you can meaningfully consult with employees. Um, This may not necessarily be the case if you're doing the collective consultation where you've got 30 or 45 days anyway, although of course you need to bear that in mind. Um, But if you're doing the shorter consultation, so where you've got less than 20 employees being made redundant, then I would give consideration to adding more time, both to enable you to have those meetings electronically or by telephone with employees together and to allow them to have discussions with representatives or amongst themselves in order to consult. So utilise things like Zoom, Microsoft Teams or any other uh, web-based video chat service so that you can see people face-to-face when you're having those discussions. And then when it comes to having individual meetings... Now that some of the restrictions on movement and the lockdown has been lifted slightly, you could still have individual meetings on a one-to-one basis, face-to-face, if they're able to travel to work or to the workplace or somewhere where you can conveniently meet, as long as you have that social distancing in place. So have it in a room where there is enough space so you can sit at least two metres apart and do all of the necessary precautions. So Don't feel that you can't meet with people face to face. Um, What you can't do, obviously, is get them all together or you shouldn't do, should I say, is get them all together in one place for a meeting. I would do that using something like Zoom or Teams and then consider having the one to one meetings because you are delivering information to employees, which can be difficult for them to receive. Um, And so having those one to one face to face meetings where possible will help with that and the communication So just to summarise, in relation to the consultation process, my advice is to give consideration to extending the length of the consultation where you're not able to meet with employees because of the coronavirus situation. And also do think about the best ways of delivering the message to people in the, the softest possible way to help them to deal with the issues and what's happening. Because undoubtedly it's a stressful time Um, And then if you add potential redundancy on top of that, it's going to make it even worse. In addition to the considerations about the timing and how you actually physically consult with employees, I think it's important to look at your timing in terms of the coronavirus job retention scheme or the furlough scheme and to try to ensure that wherever possible you are utilising the scheme to the maximum ability before making redundancies and dismissing employees. The reason I say this is because it has been emphasised on a number of occasions um, by various sources, including the Chancellor himself, that the job retention scheme is there as a job retention scheme to try to keep employees in work and to prevent a whole raft of people claiming benefits because they're unemployed. Now, I appreciate that you have to look at the business and the reasons behind it and what you need to be doing to safeguard your business. But I would give serious consideration to ensuring that you, where possible, reduce the number of redundancies or try to perhaps put off making redundancy dismissals until the end of or towards the end of the furlough scheme. Because if you dismiss employees for redundancy during the furlough scheme, whilst we're still in a lockdown situation, It's going to be difficult for them to find alternative employment. They're going to be out of work and undoubtedly they'll be aggrieved because in their mind they'll be thinking, well, you could have got my salary at 80% for another few weeks or another months um, and you've decided to terminate my employment, which means now I've got to claim universal credit or potentially have no income. So this is just really from a practical perspective um, is I would ensure that where you can access the furlough scheme and the job retention scheme, you do so for as long as you are able to before making the decision to dismiss. So if you are going through the collective consultation process, 
where there's a minimum of 45 days or 30 days. You may decide to track back from the end of the furlough scheme, which will now be the end of July for the current scheme as it stands. And then it's going to be changed uh, from July, from August to October. Um, there'll be no doubt the requirement for employers to make a contribution. So you might want to look at potentially starting your redundancy consultation process so that it ends at the end of July if you're going to be doing that or um, c- making some considerations to how you're going to handle staff on the uh, furlough scheme and really just to safeguard your reputation and also to do the best for your employees that you have. So There's just an added point there in relation to considerations for the job retention scheme. And of course, if you have any questions about that or you're concerned about any legal implications, financial implications or the reputational risk to your business of making redundancies during this time, then I would certainly recommend you get in touch and have some advice specifically for your business. Thank you so much for listening to this week's podcast. I do hope that you found it helpful in relation to your planning and and considering redundancies. As I said, if you have any questions, you can get in touch with us directly. It's alison at realemploymentlawadvice.co.uk. And from Friday, the 15th of May, if you are going through a redundancy process and you're doing it yourself, you're doing it in-house or you, you need um, some documents or some guidance, then we have produced a DIY product that you can download from our website, which contains all of the template letters, uh, HR1 form guidance and all of that sort of thing, as well as a timetable and step-by-step process for the redundancy uh, procedure. And you can find that to purchase on our website, which is adviceforemployers.co.uk forward slash DIY dash document dash shop. And you'll find the uh, documents to download there for £165 plus VAT. If, however, you would like some more bespoke advice or you want someone to help you, um, to guide you through the process and to essentially hold your hand and make sure that you're legally compliant every step, then we do offer this service and we can normally agree a fixed fee with you. So please do get in touch. It's alison at realemploymentoradvice.co.uk. Many thanks for listening. I hope you have a fantastic couple of weeks and we'll be in touch again shortly with the next episode of the Redundancy mini-series. Thanks again for listening. Just want to finalise by saying I wouldn't be a lawyer unless I had a legal disclaimer. So I must just say to you that the information in this podcast is for information only. It's general review and a general update. It's always necessary to get specific legal advice about your circumstances. So please don't rely on anything that you've heard in this podcast. But please do feel free to contact me if you'd like further information or specific advice.